If you've ever been out to Roaring River, you know how beautiful it is. But what you might not know is a local legend who called the woods there home. Author of Ozarks Alive, Caitlin McConnell, is here to discuss her recent article, Remembering the Mountain Maid of Roaring River. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Describe Jean Wallace. So Jean was a really um, interesting character. And, you know, I think that people who live in the area may have heard about her. But if, if you know, if you're not around Berry County, you may not have. And the only reason I know is because I went to the Berry County Museum. So I would put that plug in for anybody interested in local history. But what they told me and then what I learned later in research is just fascinating. And Miss Wallace was born in the 1850s, um, was not an Ozarks native, but eventually came here and developed a legacy for being clairvoyant. And so for many years of her life, um, and you know, maybe we can talk more about her backstory too in a minute, how she got to the Ozarks, but once she arrived here, she lived in the woods near Roaring River um, for much of her life and was kind of known as a local person people could go to with questions or problems because she would be able to see um, using what you know they called second sight to be able to kind of um, see into the future, see what was going on and be able to help them solve problems, you know, whether that was a life issue or even just finding something that they couldn't know where it was. And so um, she was uh, just just really, really well known for that and lived um, there until she was, I believe, in her late 80s when she actually died in a cabin fire when her house burned. And uh, that was kind of the end of the story. It was, but it was, I think she died in 1940. So she was around quite a long time from 1851 to, to 1940. Now, how did she come to realize that she could see the future? You know, from what I understand, she was a child, and I think she could just, you know, realized that she could see things um, that other people couldn't. And her father, um, you know, even when she was young, said to always use this for good and not evil. And so they embraced that and just, you know, kind of grew with it. And it, I don't know exactly if there was one thing or several things, but clearly she realized she was able to see things that other people couldn't. And I want to get back to her history of growing up, too, because she wasn't born and raised in the Ozarks. What brought her here? Well, we don't know exactly for sure. And we also, you know, unfortunately, being from so long ago, a lot of details are pretty fuzzy and there are different versions of the story. But from what I've read, you know, there are a couple of um, different stories as to how she even, I guess, came to the U.S. maybe. In one case, that she was said that she was born on a voyage coming over from Scotland. Another version said she was born in New York City. So I don't know which version is true or if either one is true. But either way, she uh, came to the Ozarks as a young adult. Um, and we don't, like I said, know quite know why either. Uh, one version I've heard said that she came with some friends and then ultimately liked the area and decided to stay. The other version I've read is that she had a fiancé or a boyfriend or some sort um, and they were on their way to Eureka Springs for some medicinal help back when that was, you know, kind of booming as a resort area. And then he passed away and she also used that as a catalyst to stay because, you know, Ring River really isn't that far away from Eureka Springs. So I'm not quite sure. Um, either way, you know, she, uh, for whatever reason, decided to stay and lived in the woods um, out in what is today known as Ring River State Park um, and just kind of built a cabin and lived there on her own. Was it rare for women during that time to homestead? I mean, in my opinion, it is. You know, you certainly don't read much about it. You know, women have always done what they needed to do. And so I know there were other women who did that. So, but the fact that she was always unmarried, had no children, you know, those things would have been pretty unusual for her to just be on her own in the woods. Um, and I, you know, it would be interesting to see what the local people thought of her initially. My impression was that, you know, while they did come to love her and appreciate her in the end, I would think in the beginning it would have been quite difficult. Now, put this in context, it's not like there was a huge settlement of people around that area then either. You know, it's still a rural area today, let alone what it was like in the late 1800s. But, you know, yeah, I would imagine she would have gotten some second looks, um, so to speak, with between, you know, even just being single and being alone, but also once people realized about her clairvoyant um, nature, I would say that there were people who probably were nice, I hope were nice, but probably others who were thinking other negative things about her and probably didn't want to have much to do with her. I read she had a lot of cats, too, and that her driveway was actually pretty worn with people looking for answers from her. Yes. And, you know, like, I, th I think that, 
like I said, it did change with time, especially once you got into the early 1900s um, when the CCC was nearby doing projects. They really kind of um, adopted her, so to speak. Most of the uh, boys did and became to be good friends. So I think that that impression, you know, as she aged, it really people accepted her perhaps more than they did in the beginning. And that said, you know, I don't know for sure that people were mean, but I would just put two and two together and kind of suspect it maybe wasn't the easiest situation. But, you know, what was interesting was part of the reason she did um, stay single, and I don't know how this, you know, co you know, works with the theory that she had a fiancé, but uh, I heard that she didn't want to get married in the end because she could, you know, theoretically know what her husband was thinking and doing and, and what wife would want that and what husband would want that. <laughs> For the reason that she decided to stay single but um yeah she kind of just really really embraced the the awareness that she had and you know which which is kind of interesting in the end though because i always wondered if she knew that the end was coming when she passed away in the fire because apparently from what i've read her demeanor really changed in the last few weeks of her life she did seem to have a form of dementia um you know it was clearly would have been very difficult for someone of that age to live on their own in a cabin in the woods you know think about carrying water and there wasn't electricity and things like that but her whole personality was different and she at one point i know um an example I heard was that she would let let a photographer come and take pictures of her, which was not really normally what she was in favor of. But for whatever reason, she decided that it was okay and told the photographer to take as many as he wanted to take. And thankfully, today we actually have those images still around, so we can you know kind of have more of an impression of what her um, you know environment looked like, what she looked like, and those are um, the ones that are at the Barry County Museum today. But all that said, you know, did she know that, that the fire was going to happen? And I don't have an answer for that, but, you know, either she accepted that that it was happening or she didn't know, but she, um, the cabin did, did catch on fire. And unfortunately, the only way they knew for sure she was in it was they found some bone fragments um, in the end. But um, it uh, was certainly the end of a legacy in that area. And talk about how the Barry County Genealogical and Historical Society is making sure that visitors are aware of Jean Wallace's legacy. Yeah, so, you know, when she was buried, a very modest stone was used to mark her gravesite in Seligman. Um, and it wasn't until many years after her death that, I guess, locals, uh, you know, maybe they thought about it before, but things finally mobilized in the early 2000s when um, the Historical Society and others came together to put a larger marker uh, at her gravesite. And so now there's a stone that tells some about her history and legacy in the area for people who happen to see her in the cemetery. And like I said, there also um, you know, is quite a bit of information at the Historical Museum in Cassville if anyone else is interested. They have a lot of photos and articles and different things that people can use to learn more as well. All right, Caitlin McConnell, thank you so much. Thank you. And you can find this article and more Ozarks history on Caitlin's website, ozarksalive.com. We'll be right back.